Sherborne. Sherborne School on June the 10th in the year of our Lord, 1950. And these voices that you hear are the voices of the boys of Sherborne. For this week they celebrate the 400th anniversary of the date when this great school received its royal charter from King Edward VI. No one who stands in this ancient abbey and hears these clear, fresh young voices ring out beneath the lofty vaulted roof could possibly be unmoved by the ancient traditions of the place. And something of this feeling is reflected in the familiar words of Ecclesiasticus, read by the head of the school. Let us now praise famous men and our fathers that begat us. The Lord manifested in them great glory, even his mighty power from the beginning, such as did bear rule in their kingdoms and were men renowned for their power giving counsel by their understanding, such as have brought tidings in prophecies. Leaders of the people by their counsels. Leaders of the people by their counsels. Sherborne has never forgotten its friends. They are remembered now in the commemoration read by the headmaster. He gives thanks to the school's benefactors through the ages and then he concludes in these words. And herewith we make our prayer that we, remembering the munificence of our benefactors and the example of our predecessors, may make good and pious use of all our opportunities and so play our part as citizens of this realm and members of Christ Holy Church, that there may be a bountiful harvest from the seed they sowed to the welfare of this land and the glory of our God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Once more, the abbey is filled with voices uplifted in praise. As the music of Vaughan Williams' setting of the Te Deum rises and falls in this ancient abbey, the great paean of praise ebbs and flows. Echoes of the voices are thrown up from the stone floor to the vaulted roof. Then, down from the chancel steps, up towards the altar, the echoes glancing off the long windows through which a shaft of June sunlight strikes down to catch bright gleams from the golden crosses of the bishops or to strike fire from the facets of the archbishop's ring. And presently, as the singing dies slowly away, we come to the Lord's Prayer. Yes. 
Presently, the Archbishop rises in his place. He walks slowly down towards the pulpit and there stands for a moment in contemplation. A figure human and yet symbolic. Although his magnificent robes add great dignity to the splendor of the church's highest office, there is yet a feeling that this is a man among men, aloof and yet somehow not out of touch with his congregation. It is not for me to presume or to interpret to you the intimate secrets of this fellowship. But consider that which underlies it all, the context in which this and every other lovely thing of this beloved country of ours exists. This service implies that we can trust history, not as a fortuitous dance of leaves in the air, nor yet as a predetermined mechanism, but as the scene of a moral purpose of a moral conflict in which man is engaged and in which each succeeding age takes its place in the unfolding of the purpose of God for man. This is not only a great celebration, but also in some sense a great reunion. The words of this hymn have a special significance for us today. For memory's golden treasure, for boyhood's cloudless brow, each bright and harmless pleasure, each brave and holy vow and friends still clinging nearer as chance and change befall and some by death made dearer we thank thee Lord for all Outside the abbey, in the school ground, the parents are assembling for a play. More than a thousand years have gone to the shaping of Sherburne's great traditions, and an impression of this is given 
by Mr. V.C. Clinton Beardley's chronicle play, which he calls Sherborne's Story. But it's much more than a play. It is a pageant of English history seen through the discerning eyes and the sensitive mind of an old Sherbernian. And an old Sherbernian, moreover, who knows not only what Sherborne owes to history, but what England owes to her great public schools. Now, close your eyes for a moment and imagine yourself once more at Sherborne. You're looking down towards the grey and ancient chapel steps and upon the walls of the library. It is early afternoon. There are no spotlights on this natural stage, save where the noonday sun blazes down from a cloudless June sky. The play opens with John, newcomer to Sherburn, a figure reminiscent of all small boys, bewildered, solitary, as he stands on the threshold of this strange new world. To John, there speaks a voice from the past. John? Yes, sir. And you're coming to Sherborne? Yes, sir. I think so. I hope so. And you wanted to know what it was all like years ago? Yes, sir. But how... How did I know? This is a place of many walls. Yes, sir. And walls... Come here, sir. And buildings, I sometimes think, have memories. And much has happened in this place. How old was it, sir? I will tell you if you will listen. I will show you if you will look. So John stands a little way off by the buttress at the edge of the stage and watches while the pageant of the years goes by. To him is unfolded the coming of another boy in the year 860. Then scenes from the Middle Ages when ignorance and evil combine to suppress the monasteries. In the words of Clinton Badley's character, the evil genius of the place. Then was my art. My cabalistic art turned all to dark in Thomas Cromwell's heart. He spake the word that crowned my soul's endeavor. He spake and closed these hateful gates forever. <laughs> call, if ye will, to prayer. Ye call in vain. The bell has tolled that will not ring again. <laughs> and sure enough, on March the 18th, 1539, his evil predictions are fulfilled. For here comes Sir John Horsey with the King's order to evict the monks. This is a heavy day, John Horsey. Aye, my lord abbot, but is the King's order. I know it, my son. And ye have all made surrender of your own free will, mind. You are not forced. Not forced, John Horsey, no. Only remind you of the fate of the brethren of the Charterhouse, of the abbot of Reading, of the abbot of Glastonbury, but not forced, no. Ah, Abbot, you must not be bitter with me. I have old ties with this place. The monks who have lived and laboured here for five and a half centuries are driven out. All save one, Roger Percy, who is permitted to continue his independent teaching. But presently, fortune turns a kindlier face, and eleven years later, the school receives a royal charter and a grant of lands from King Edward VI. Of this royal school, John Hancock, who was master from 1565 to 1573, says this. In all things, we require the scholars to demean themselves scholastically, passing by the streets to be courteous to all men, having no converse with the rude boys of the town, wearing their apparel clean and decently, without willful spoiling their arms. Uh, they are not to frequent taverns, Master Master. Yes, certainly not. Not to play at cards and a dice, nor use bad words nor ribaldry. And I must tell you, sir, that the master and the usher have power to search diligently in the houses of parents for any evidence of misconduct. A hundred years go by, and Cromwell's troops are billeted on the school. The happenings of another century are unfolded now, until in 1785 the state of the school has gone from bad to worse. According to a governor of the school at that time. <laughs> the scholars come in and work down, and the master permits them to traverse the streets to all hours, to ramble through the neighboring villages with dogs and guns. 
banned from Tipple publicly in alehouses. The play is nearing its close, and the stage fills with boys singing fair and grey and ancient. But the evil genius has not finished with them yet. And presently we find him calling down upon Sherburn the menace of the German Luftwaffe, so that presently smoke enshrouds these ancient walls, and the words of the evil one himself are drowned in the fury of driving aeroplanes and exploding bombs. The play over, we walk now the few yards across the gravel drive, away from the dramatic influence of the play to the more down-to-earth atmosphere of a prize-giving, where we hear a farewell speech from the headmaster. Our job is to turn out men, and a man is worth much more than many pairs of boots and motor bicycles. And our job is not only to turn out men, but a special quality of men. Our aim is to turn out leaders of men. And now it is evening, and the shadows lengthen in the Sherburne cloisters, and from the gathering darkness we hear the familiar sounds of the carmen. This great occasion is drawing to its close. On the cricket field there have been fireworks, including a 30-foot set piece of Edward VI, copied from the oil painting in the library. The road along the slopes has been crowded with cars and people seeking a distant view. But now the abbey tower and the library and the chapel steps are flatlit. This is the moment that we have all been waiting for, the climax, the final act. And presently it comes. From the darkness of the cloisters, through the archway near the foot of the chapel steps, there comes the Bishop of Salisbury with one of his predecessors, Bishop Lovett, a staunch old Sherburnian, and the headmaster. Slowly they mount the steps, slowly turn to face the crowd. And in the stillness of a perfect summer night, against a background of these grey walls with darkness turning their sharp outlines to soft shadows, we hear in the voice of the Bishop of Salisbury the blessing with new significance and great beauty. May the holy protection and the merciful loving kindness of the eternal God who has watched over this school through all the years in dark days as in fair, be with you in the days to come, guarding and guiding you in all your ways. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be upon you and remain with you always.